Well, hey guys, I, I am really excited to dig into God's Word with you again uh, this Sunday. Before I begin, though, I just need to get something off of my chest. Uh, it's going to be kind of hard to hear, but uh, I've, I've honestly waited a long time to say this in a public setting. So now that you're here and I'm here, I can say it and I can get it off of my chest. So here it is. Um, if you're walking on a sidewalk or in an aisle at a grocery store or down a hiking path, or for that matter, just about anywhere, and you are walking down the left side of the path, and someone that's coming toward you is walking down the right side of the path, and you make that person get over, you are the problem. <laughs> Seriously. And why is it that the people who don't get this are always at like places like Costco or like super crowded locations, walking on the wrong side of the path, and I'm just like, picture yourself in a car, okay? This is the lane. This is my lane. This is your lane. Okay, let's not do a head-on collision. Anyway, right side of the road. <laughs> and I could keep going. Thank you. Thank you for that. I could keep going. And as a matter of fact, I think I will for just a second. Um, I just want to list a few more of my pet peeves. I really don't like long goodbyes. And uh, yeah, my wife's from Minnesota, so God kind of works together on that. Um, one time, okay. One time, okay, Dan Olofsson right there is from Minnesota. And it, him and his wife, Katie, were, were over at our house. And Katie and I, at one point, Katie and I just looked at each other because Dan and her, being from Minnesota, they must have gone on for 45 minutes by the, after we'd said goodbye. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> it was good, though. But, man, they just kept opening up the conversation. But for me, like, if I have signaled that I'm on my way out, like, I am on my way out. Like, that, I'm walking out. I'm going to the car. I'm gone. Okay, here's another pet peeve I have, since apparently I'm making sure none of you have me on a pedestal this morning, which is good, I suppose. Have you ever noticed that people are modifying their headlights on Jeeps to look angry now? Like, I don't know how they're doing it. Maybe there's a part you can buy from the Jeep store or what, but you just kind of, they're like on the headlights that look like eyes and then like angry eyebrows. And like, maybe you're just doing that to look cool. But I got to thinking about it the other day, and I think it says something about our culture. And I think it's actually pretty revealing about a larger issue. And the bottom line is that a whole lot of people are ready to fight over just about anything. We're just kind of like, Ugh, you know, ready to go. Um, and I mean, have you noticed the sudden uptick in angry bumper stickers and defensive t-shirts that like have things on them that like, whoa, I didn't even, I wasn't even thinking that, but uh, thanks for cussing me out because I read your bumper sticker or your t-shirt. It's like, whew. I mean, people, people are on edge, right? Everyone's had it. We're sick and tired of being taken advantage of. You know, flags have become a canvas for our opinions uh, and uh, cuss words and all. And uh, the reasons for this are complicated, but the first couple um, verses from chapter 4 of James really gives us a pretty good insight into this. So let's go ahead and get into that. Uh, it says, What is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from passions that wage war within you? You desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. James tells us that the true source of the defensive mentality that we see around us and feel around us is actually the, the desire to have what cannot be obtained, what we can't get. James then explains in the next couple verses that actually we can have everything we need in Christ. So that brings me to the question this morning, my fellow believers. If we have everything we need in Christ then why are we still so often fighting for what is only going to slip through our fingers right along with the rest of the world? And please don't misunderstand me. I'll be voting when it's time to vote, and I'm thankful for the service of our troops. But I'm talking about the state of our culture and the arena of war that involves our opinions. The Bible is clear that the enemy is not other people. And the war that we should be found fighting is a spiritual one. Ephesians 6, 12, many of you have heard it. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this world's darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Okay, but wait a minute, red-headed preacher. Aren't we supposed to stand up and fight for what's right in the Bible, even when people hate it? Yes, we are. But the way in which we stand is really vitally important. There's a dramatic irony in the fact that the lost world's hatred of us for our beliefs and our values and our actions actually prompts us to react in a way 
that makes us kind of like them. When we let that happen, Satan wins the battle. And the lost are pushed even farther away from the truth because we compromise the integrity of our own message. So the question is, how can we be countercultural for Christ without launching a counteroffensive at the people in the world? As we study the first section of Titus 3, we will uncover three practical steps that will help us actually answer that question. First, we're going to remember where we came from. Second, we're going to remember the big butt. I'll get to that and what kind of butt we're talking about. And third, remember the hope that you have. Let's get into the word. Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. It says, remind them to submit to rulers and authorities. Oh boy, this again, even after COVID. <laughs> to obey, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting, and to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy. Through the washing and regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, he poured out his Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. And before I go any deeper into that, I just want to point out something neat about our passage today. The book of Titus was written by Paul, and it was to Titus, who was actually one of the very first early church pastors. And he, he was like Timothy in that he was Paul's son in the faith. So understand that what we just read was actually an inspired letter from an experienced pastor to his apprentice, in a sense. That said, we just read about something that Paul wanted Timothy to literally remind the church of, over and over again. That's what is meant by the first two words of the passage. Remind them is a charge to Titus to remind the church that he was pastoring. So I figured that if God wanted Pastor Titus to remind his church of these things, that we would do well to brush over them as well today in our church. Because after all, the last part of our text really doesn't leave any room for explaining away the hard parts by saying this was only a message to pastors or to Titus or to even just Titus's church. Verse 8 literally says that everything we just read is good and profitable for everyone. Paul also asked Titus to insist on these things in verse 8. What that means is that these are not just side points for the New Testament church. These are not just optional instructions that God would have us sort of tuck away for later. We would do well to realize instead that the teachings in this passage not only directly apply to us, but that God expects these things of his church. He expects these things of our church. So let's start by taking a look at verses 1 through 3. On the screen behind me, there should be a T-chart or a chart with some, with some characteristics there. Hopefully pretty soon. And I, I just want you to take a look at that and, and just notice how opposite the two sides of the chart really are. Pretty opposite. Those in Christ should submit to rulers and authorities and obey. Those who are in the world are expected to be foolish, disobedient, and deceived. Those in Christ should be ready for every good work. The, uh, and those in the world are expected to be enslaved to various passions and pleasures. Those in Christ should slander no one, avoid fighting, be kind, and always pursue gentleness with everyone. Those who are of the world are expected to be living in malice and envy, to be hateful, to be detesting one another. Now I want to make sure that I point out that the of Christ part of the chart back there is really the end goal for us. If we're really living everything out on that list, that means we're succeeding at being countercultural without launching a counteroffensive. But thankfully, God knows that we need just a little bit more than just a list of Beatitudes. And that's the reason that Paul goes on in verses 3 through 8. Because for the most part, this is one of those passages that anybody can basically just read and know what it says. The language is pretty clear. Um, the problem that we have with Titus 3, 1 through 8 is that we really, really don't want to do what it says. <laughs> I mean, really. It, it's, it's really pretty hard to think about how challenging some of these commands are. For instance, how are we supposed to submit to rulers and authorities who aren't Christians? What if they're even evil or deceitful or wicked? That's hard. How are we supposed to always show gentleness to all people? 
it's hard enough to be gentle with good people, especially if you need a chocolate bar or you're getting cranky, you know. I mean, we all go through that. But with all people, what about bad people? <laughs> what about people who hate our guts? Everything in our flesh wants to forget about all that. But that's exactly why Paul is telling Titus to remind them. Church, I am with you on this. I admit that this is extremely challenging. But we need to remember that the yoke of our Savior is easy. And his burden is light. Often the difficulty of a situation can be changed by our perspective. And in many ways, that's exactly what this passage calls for. A change in perspective. Given that reality, I'm going to direct our focus away from a word study of the particular attributes on the T-chart, per se, and spend more time today talking about what it actually takes to live out what we're reading. The first step we can take to be countercultural for Christ without launching a counteroffensive on the world is to remember where we came from. Let's read verses 1 through 3 again. It says, Remind them to submit to rulers and authorities to obey, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting, and to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. And then at the beginning of verse 3, it says, For we too were once. The we in this passage refers to Paul, it refers to Titus, believers in Titus's church, but more importantly, it refers to all believers. And the idea here is that every believer was once an unbeliever. I know, shockingly profound. It's incredibly basic, and yet it's so easy to forget about. What if our first reaction to the lost world had left less to do with fire and brimstone, and instead we thought to ourselves, I too was once fill in the blank. Within the heart of every human being, God has given us the capacity to empathize. Empathy is different from sympathy in that it revolves around your own experience. Um, sympathy is just telling somebody, hey, I, I'm sorry for how you feel, but empathy is having gone through that experience. And the reason I bring that up is because the reality is that every believer in this room has experienced being lost before being found. We can empathize. We've experienced what it was like to be foolish and deceived, caught up in passions and pleasures, and a constant struggle for looking all the wrong answers, all the right answers in all the wrong places. And that leads us to the heart of the matter. Believers, we need to start seeing who we once were in the eyes of the lost again. Only then will we stop hating and start loving. Only then will we be, stop being so angry and start helping. Only then can we be countercultural for Christ without launching a counteroffensive at the world. L listen, there's a fine line here. I'm not saying that sin shouldn't repulse you as a believer, because it should. And I'm not saying that evil in this world shouldn't make you seek God's justice, because it just will. But if the lost world is making you so upset that you're starting to look like you belong on the other side of the chart, then there's a problem. If you're feeling hateful and disobedient, if you're detesting the world around you, if you're living in malice and envy because the world is evil and yet seems to prosper while you struggle, there's a problem. I love my son in a very special way. But there are still some times that he absolutely drives me bonkers. <laughs> I mean nuts. And, I mean, he's very bright, but he's also very particular. And the two tend to go hand in hand. Not always, but definitely with him. And I can just remember in his toddler years, um, man, when he would be building stuff with Legos or blocks or something like that, and he would have one picture in his mind of how it was going to be perfect, you know, advanced beyond. And then there would be what he could do physically as a toddler. And when those two things didn't match, man, he would get so upset. He couldn't make it happen the way he wanted it to happen. And he would, you know, that's when he would get the most upset over anything. And I remember one day I decided I just had enough. I lost my temper, and I ended up yelling at him to not get so mad about something like that. Now, some of you are already seeing the irony in that, but it gets worse. Later in the week, I decided I was going to hang some pictures up on the wall. And of course, I didn't have a stud finder, so like any self-respecting man, I grabbed my hammer and a nail and started looking for that stub in the wall. Not the best way to go about it. <laughs> but after I'd made holes across about half of one of our walls, I started to get pretty frustrated. And that's when I just had to leave my hammer and nail behind and step outside and cool off. I didn't want to have that hammer being that upset, if you know what I'm saying, men. Anyway. It was then that I realized how much 
I was still just exactly like my son. Here I was expecting him to have learned a lesson that I had not completely learned. Now, do I still believe it's wrong to lose your temper over trivial things like that? Yes, I do. But the difference between then and now is that I have grace for my son. I understand what he's going through because I've been through it. So when I started to make the connection between my son and myself, and I started realizing that how he acts is how I used to act, sometimes still struggle not to act that way, everything changed. Believers, when it comes to you and the sinful world we live in, how are you doing with this? Are you remembering where you came from? Or are you expecting deceived and confused people to act like the saint you never were without Jesus? Let's be honest. For those of us who have been believers for the majority of our lives, it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget about this, about who we were before Christ. So I want to give you some practical steps in applying this point. First, I would highly recommend writing out your own testimony and focus in specifically on the before Jesus part of your testimony. And be honest with yourself and make it clear. And if you've already done that and written out your testimony, I would suggest taking something with you to remind you of who you once were without Christ before you go out into the world. Maybe you have a photo of yourself during your unbelieving years that you could keep on your dashboard and then it would double as a conversational piece um, with anybody who's in your car. Or maybe you have something that used to have a hold on your life and no longer does. You can carry that around with you. Whatever it might be, given our passage today, I think it would be quite biblical to remind yourself of who you once were before Jesus entered the scene. Now, for those of you who were saved at a young age, like myself, maybe it would be better for you to carry around something that reminds you of who you would be today without Christ. Right? Perhaps there's certain sins in your life that you just know would not be overcome, would not have been conquered had you not been a, uh, a believer. However you need to go, go about this and apply this, just remember that in order to be countercultural for Christ without launching a counteroffensive at the world, you will need to remember where you came from. The second step outlined in our text today is to remember the big but. In case there is a need for clarity here, I am talking about the contraction, not someone's rear end. However, I won't lie that we preachers sometimes word things in a special way just to keep some of you from falling asleep at any rate, I do hope that you will remember this from that. That said, let's jump into Titus 3, 4 through 7. Here's what the Word of God says. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared. Boy, when it starts out with that, you know it's going to be good. He saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy, through the washing and regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out His Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Perhaps the most powerful two words put together in the English language are, but God. We see it all over the Old and New Testament, over and over again throughout the course of human history after the fall. Humanity has really shown, not, has not been great. We've shown faithlessness, but God has shown faithfulness. I can stand here today because there's always been a but God for God's chosen people and for those who never deserved for God to act. We serve a loving and merciful God who is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. And that comes straight from the word of God. Church, we not only need to remember where we came from, but we need to remember who got us out. It wasn't us. Look at what we just read. Verse 5 says that God saved us and that it wasn't by works of righteousness that we had done. That's pretty clear. Verse 4 says that God was kind to us and that God has loved mankind. So how does this connect with how we fit in a lost world as believers? Well, let me just ask you this. If anyone had a right to be unkind, wouldn't it have been our all-powerful God? If anyone had every reason to hate mankind, wouldn't it have been our God who hates sin more than we can imagine? If anyone had a right to withhold mercy and pour out condemnation, would it not have been our Savior Jesus as he was nailed to the cross? Who do we think we are? Our hearts and minds have been regenerated and renewed by the Holy Spirit, as it says at the end of verse 5. We have a righteousness that's been given to us. We have a salvation that was won for us. We have an identity that was redeemed 
for us. We don't deserve what we've been given. We don't deserve the but God part of the gospel. Yet here we stand, forgiven, redeemed, set free, and made holy. And when we remember that that is our position before God, that's when we're going to start seeing the loss differently. Instead of wanting them to face judgment, we'll begin to desire and even pray that they would realize their own. But God. So in order to be countercultural for Christ without launching a counteroffensive at the world, you will need to remember where you came from. You'll need to remember the big but. And lastly, you'll need to remember the hope you have. Let's read verses 6 through 7 again together. Paul writes, He poured out His Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. This is talking about heaven. This is about what followers of Christ can expect in the future. The hope of eternal life. Nothing really puts things into perspective, like the reality of an eternity that actually goes beyond the present. Listen, this is a very important step that we can't forget. Because it really is what allows us to let go of what the world is holding on to so tightly. Allow me to explain. There's a reason that people who are lost are foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and detesting one another. The reason is that they have no real hope. They're holding on to things like ego or a bunch of other ideals that basically boil down to selfishness at one point or another because when God is not God, self takes his place. The problem is that self can never fill the void that was meant for God to fill. And so what we see in the loss is a constant struggle to attain the unattainable and to keep what will inevitably be taken. As believers, we need to remember that we have something that can never be taken. We have something better than our own sense of self-worth. We have something better than passing pleasures. We have something better than winning fights and looking good to those around us. We have the hope of eternity with Christ. Think about it this way. Let's say for a fact that in two years, uh, you just, you know for certain, it's in writing, um, that you will be given $10 billion. And I, I just looked it up just to make sure, and that's like not even a fraction of what some of the richest people in the world have, and yet I can still barely comprehend it. You would definitely be set because one billion is a thousand million, and I, can, I, I don't think I can really comprehend that. So 10 billion, you'd be set. If someone were to break into your home, steal some money and some of your possessions, and rob you, yeah, it would suck. It would still be hard to deal with. But the knowledge of the future would be a tremendous comfort to you. Because ultimately you would know that in a short time you could sort of look back at it all and forget about it because it's dwarfed in comparison. That's what it's like when we remember our inheritance. Listen, here's my point. Always being gentle and kind to a lost world is possible when we realize that what we have to look forward to is so much better than what we could lose here on earth. Submitting to rulers and authorities is a lot easier when we remember the king of our eternity. Always being gentle and kind is natural when we are no longer fighting to gain what we cannot keep anyway. The point is, when the lost world thinks it has taken something from us, we need to surprise them with our response. They expect us to become like them. And as the church, we need to show them something different. We need to show the world that we count all things as rubbish in comparison to Christ and his kingdom, as Paul said in Philippians 3 eight. We need to show the world that we don't have to live in malice and envy anymore, that we don't have to be hateful, that we don't have to disobey, we don't have to detest others. Why? Because our lives no longer are insecure and hopeless. We have something that can't be taken. A heavenly kingdom is coming for those who believe and have placed their faith in the identity and work of Jesus Christ. So I ask you, fellow believer. Is God and his coming eternity still filling the hole in your heart? Or is there something else? For most of us, I'm willing to bet there's something. Maybe it's your home. Do you find yourself always thinking angry thoughts because people don't clean up after their pets or park in front of your your front yard? I do. I, I mean, I've been there. But try to remember the room your father has prepared for you and realize that whatever house you have now is dwarfed in comparison. 
Is your mind consumed by political rhetoric, always forming arguments and imagining debates with the other side? Give yourself a break from the news and take time to really remember the good news of eternity and Christ and that it's better than any of that. Perhaps there's someone you work with or go to school with who doesn't treat you like they should. Maybe they're condescending or just plain rude. Maybe they're hurtful. I don't know. But I've worked with a lot of people that have been unkind in my life. And I know what it's like to let your thoughts be consumed by getting back at them and making things even. But the thing is, I also know it just doesn't make anything better. It makes things worse. So stop worrying about what they think of you and about what they make other people think of you. And let them think poorly of you. Let them be wrong about you. Because your Savior knows you. He knows you. And he has prepared a place for you in heaven. Let your thoughts be consumed with how you look in his eyes. Not theirs. If you want to be countercultural for Christ without launching a counteroffensive at the world, remember the hope that you have. However, it's going to be pretty impossible to do that you don't have any hope to begin with. Believers have been promised eternity in heaven, but if you made it all the way to your seat this morning and you don't even really know what you believe in, first of all, I'm very glad you're here. And second of all, I just want to put the thought in your head that maybe, just maybe, God has you here for a reason. Maybe you've found yourself in a lot of churches over the years. Maybe you've taken a look at the smorgasbord of religions And you don't know what to make of it. You don't know what to make of it. I mean, why believe one thing over another thing? Who's wrong? Who's right? Is it all just made up? Is there anything worth believing in? A famous Christian author by the name of C.S. Lewis was once asked, what makes Christianity different from all the other religions? And Lewis responded, one word, grace. Listen, I'm here to tell you that the God of the Bible is the only God who came down to us to bring us salvation. All of the gods and religions are about what you can do to be okay with God, what you can do. And the thing is, if you think about it, that's really kind of impossible. If God is truly holy and just and righteous, and I think we should want him to be, then it stands to reason that none of us can actually measure up to God's standards. I don't know about you, but have you seen other people? Have you seen yourself? (laughs) We can't measure up to that standard. But he came to us in the form of Jesus to take our place for us on the cross, to, to take on the punishment of our sin so that we could be made righteous in God's sight. See, the difference is we serve a God who actually loves us. He made a way because he knew that you just couldn't make one. Always asking for you to do is to believe in Jesus and what he did on the cross and, and what he did when he rose again that he promised and gave you eternity. Listen, if you came into this building looking to hear truth, This is it. You've heard it. This is the truth of the gospel. I'm going to give you a moment to respond as we close to what the Lord is doing in your heart. Let's go to the hymn in prayer. Lord, I pray for anyone in this room that may not know you. Lord, our heart's cry is that they would come to know you because the believers in here, we know how good you are. We know you're the answer. We know you're the truth. (laughs) Lord, I pray that such one would, would make a decision today to trust, to put their faith in you and what you've done and say, God, I'm leaving it all behind. I'm putting all my eggs in this basket of the gospel. I'm, I'm taking hold of you now. I'm asking that you save me. I repent of the way that I have been. Lord, I just pray that somebody would do that. Lord, I pray for the rest of us that we would apply um, what we've learned from your word today. And uh, just give us, give us the strength to do it. It's hard stuff. Help us to change our perspective so that it isn't so hard anymore <laughs> to apply. And thank you for this day. Amen.